Well, Glory, this is Dudley. Good to be back with you guys again this month. We, uh, we're staying on the cross, the subject of the cross. Paul said it to the Corinthians, I chose to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. So we're in good company when we focus on the cross. Hey, a couple of things I want to mention to you. Hey, as I record this, uh, we're just a day or two away from uh, the annual uh, treasure hunt weekend with the ladies. The, the, I think the place is basically full of women who've come from around the country to get together, worship together, learn together, have fun together, apply the gospel to their lives together. So that's going to be a fun time. And uh, then uh, the uh, marriage retreat is coming up real quick, uh, uh, October 6th, 7th, and 8th. I think you'll get this before then. Uh, there may be some room, but we've got quite a b bunch coming. And if you if there's not room, that's good incentive for you to sign up for next year. And next year, we should have the new facility already and have room for more. Uh, with more people having opportunities to have private rooms, or, or at least, uh, uh, yeah, private rooms. Uh, so Betsy's place is almost done, and we can't wait to, to get it in use. Uh, so... Uh, the, uh, the round table, it's going to be a wonderful time. I, uh, theological round table. I don't know if we have any spots left. It's basically full. Uh, there could be somebody drops out and leaves a spot somewhere, but anyway, uh, that's, uh, a little later on in October. Uh, that, that brings to mind though, that I want to remind you of this, uh, this month's resource. I, several months ago, I did a, a two-part series on leadership in church about elders, uh, pastors, presbytery, leadership. What, what's all that about? And what does the scripture teach about that? I think that would be really helpful to, uh, to you in, in your church setting. And uh, so I recommend to you to get that. You can go to our website and get a hold of that. I want to thank you for those of you who have contributed to... Uh, to our work, particularly during the summer, as we have sought to uh, invest in young lives and, and the future. Uh, we need your help. We appreciate your help. You are partners with us. Thank you for every investment you make. And it is a good investment. Okay, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the book of Mark. Mark's gospel. Mark was uh, writing his, his version of the gospel, his perspective of the gospel. Uh, the theme of it seems to be obvious in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Mark says, uh, after John was put in prison, prison, Jesus came forth preaching the gospel of God, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Not saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe. And then he spends the rest of the book showing what this kingdom, this new kingdom looks like. The kingdom had been a concept in the minds of the readers, the hearers, uh, for hundreds of years. It had taken its form uh, from Daniel, and uh, when, when Daniel was uh, taken as a captive to, to Babylon, and there were dreams and visions by Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel had some, and they were all about kingdoms. They were about the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of Persia, the kingdom of Greece, the kingdom of Rome. But it talked about, it prophesied a time when there would be a new kingdom set up that was not made with, with human hands, and it would be eternal. And it would be when the Son of Man came before the, the Ancient of Days and, and was granted this kingdom. And uh, Jesus comes along, and he identifies as the Son of Man and says, that day has come. Uh, the kingdom has come with my coming, with my birth, my life, my death, my resurrection, my ascension, my give, giving of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom has come. And so it's a radical thing. And so Mark is uh, talking about this radical thing that has happened, this thing called the gospel of God. And so he's, he, the first part of it, he's just showing who Jesus is. He, kick, he heals people. He makes blind eyes see. He kicks out demons. Uh, he causes the wind and the waves to... Uh, to listen to his voice, uh, he feeds feeds people, feeds five thousand with a few pieces of bread and some fish, and and so uh, he's demonstrating that this kingdom really has 
intervene into human history, into Earth's history, and that it's radically different. But as we get to uh, around chapters 9, 10, 11, 12, long in there, we, we see Jesus moving from uh, this is who I am kind of demonstrated to you need to know exactly who I am and what are the implications of that. And that's where we are today. And so uh, if you want to read along with me, you can turn with me to Mark chapter 8. And that's where I'll be reading. Uh, it's a familiar passage of scripture for most people, but uh, for some not, but we're going to read it and then we're going to talk about it, okay? Here we go. This is verse 27, Mark 8, 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, Others said, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you're the Messiah. He sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Notice here, but we're not through reading, but note, Jesus did not deny that title. When, when Peter said that was who he was, Jesus didn't say, oh, no, no, not, not that. No, he, he, he knew who he was, and that's important. Verse 31, then, that is, after Peter's confession of knowing who he was, then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called a crowd with the disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who, want to, those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until, the, until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. What a great passage, huh? Okay, so here's what, here's what we're going to talk about today. The implications of what Christ, who Christ is and what he has done become a mandate for our obedience. You say, what, what, are, what are you saying, Dudley? Oh, okay, this is just a theme, and then we're going to try to break it down. But let me tell you what I'm saying. The, under the old covenant, it was if you obey these stipulations, if you obey the law, then you're blessed. If you disobey, you're cursed. That, that's the covenant. Okay, so are we still under that? No. Jesus came to radically change it. So he is saying in, his, in this new covenant, in this new way, the, the reason you obey is because of what, who Christ is and what he's done. It's not in order to get a blessing. It's not in order to keep from being punished. It is, if Christ really is that, and if he has done that, then that's, this is what I got to do. It, it's, it's exactly what Mark had said earlier, the, the verse I quoted earlier in, in 114. The time is fulfilled the kingdom of God has come, therefore repent. The implications of what has happened, of, of what's real, become a mandate. It becomes, okay, this is what you're supposed, excuse me, you're supposed to do. You, you don't have to look for a list anymore. You don't have to look for regulations anymore. You don't have to look for God to give you instructions anymore. No, who he is gives you instructions. What he's done gives you instructions. So that's, that's the theme of what we're talking about. So uh, so I, you, 
here should be a good title for this whole thing. The big reveal and its implications. But the big reveal is important. They had been seeing Jesus do these miraculous things. And now Jesus says, okay, I, I need y'all to tell me who, who do you think I am? So that's why he asked the question. Peter chimes in and says, you're the, you're the Messiah. You're the, you're the one that, that God promised would come and set all things right. You're the one that's going to establish a kingdom that's going to last forever. You're the one who's going to destroy all the other kingdoms. You're the one. And we're, we're glad about that. So they knew who he was. He was the Messiah. They knew the prophecies. The catch was they didn't know how he was going to do that. And so you can imagine Peter's consternation when, when after Jesus, after Peter said, you're the Messiah, and, and basically Jesus said, yep, right? Then he said, now I must go into Jerusalem and suffer at the hands of the chief priest and the leaders and the elders, and I must die you can imagine Peter going, whoa, whoa, no way. That's not how you set things right. Remember Daniel's prophecy? He might have been thinking. <laughs> Come on, Jesus, remember Daniel's prophecy? The stone rolled down the mountain and crashed into the image and destroyed those other kingdoms and established a new kingdom. You got to destroy those things. So so you don't, you don't go and suffer and die. That's a give up. That, that's defeat. That, that's not how you do it. You, you do it by, by destroying them. So we, we got we, we to gotta get rid of some people. Heads need to roll. Things need to change. Systems got to be revamped. You, you're not, you, you're not, that's not going to happen to you. And that's when, when Jesus rebuked him using the same word as when he talked to demons, he rebuked him. Stop it. You're not thinking the thoughts of God. You're thinking the thoughts like man thinks. And so, uh, so Peter is rebuked, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And so then he calls the rest of the, the crowd together, the crowd that's listening along with the disciples, and says, Okay, now, y'all know who I am. You know that I'm the one that's going to set things right. I am the fulfillment of the promise. Now, here's how it's going to work. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to die. If you're going to be my follower from this point on, if you're going to share my life, then you will have to take the same life. Your life will look like mine. You will have to give up your agenda, you will have to let me be everything that you need and you will, you will get to follow me. And if you don't do that, then you're really not a follower of me. You are trying to use me to get your own agenda done. So that's, that's the story here. Oh, and the end, end part of it, he says, by the way, there's some of you standing here that are going to get to see how this really does work. You're going to get to see the beginning stages of how death and resurrection actually does destroy other kingdoms, and uh, you're going to get to see it. So, so that's the whole deal. So let's look at several things. There's several words here I want us to look at that uh, will help us get a hold of, of this whole thing. Uh, first of all, I, I want to reemphasize that Jesus said, I must go and die. Why? Why, why, why must he? It wasn't that Jesus was saying, look, it's just going to happen. I'm going to go and they're, they're too strong and they're going to take me and they're going to... No, no, he said, I, I must go and I must voluntarily go. And I, 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 it's important that I go this way. And I must be rejected not by, uh, you know, not by wicked people. I've got to be rejected by the religious people. I've got to be rejected by those who who won't give up their agenda uh, because they are still operating on kingdoms that operate by power 
and money. I don't operate by power and money. I operate by love and mercy. And, and I know human thinking can't figure out how that works, uh, but that's how it's going to work. And so I must go and I must suffer. Well, if you have any human thinking, fallen human thinking, uh, you're gonna go, I don't see how that's gonna work. Uh, so, he, so, so Jesus is describing the radical nature of this new kingdom that he came to bring. So there, there are three things that I'd like to mention why he must. Why must Jesus go and die? Well, because sin, <laughs> sin has to be paid for. So there are three things. No, note these. First of all, Jesus must go and, and go on the cross because I, as a fallen human, need the love that is released when he does that. Now let me unpack that for you a minute. The human heart longs to be loved unconditionally. No other human heart can love like that. That's why it's really dangerous to put that on your husband or your wife to say, you, you got to love me in a way that satisfies my longing. He, she can't. He can't. Not just in human power. Because the human heart always has to, it, you can love somewhat unconditionally, but there's always, yeah, but I can't, I can't keep giving if I don't get some back. I mean, this thing has to be reciprocal. So I can't just love eternally, unconditionally, unless something comes back. So no human, no human love can satisfy the longing of the human heart. Please hear that. Because it, it, takes you, it keeps you from putting things on people that they, they can't do. But Jesus said, I can, I can. I gave it all. I can love you without asking anything from you. I, it's my pain, your gain. Not my pain, your gain, and I get a little gain. No, it's, it, it's unconditional love. Everybody longs for that. It's the only thing that satisfies the human heart. Jesus gave it all. I, I hope that settles in your heart. When that settles in your heart, you'll know then because you share that life, you can reflect that. You can give it all. And that's what he's saying when he says, if you try to gain anything, you'll lose it. But if you lose it, you gain it. It, it, it's a, it seems like a paradox, but, but it isn't. It's just the way the kingdom works. So, so I need his love. I, I, nobody can love me like Jesus. And until I find his love, I'm not free from selfish love, fake love. Uh, secondly, I need a pardon. I'm guilty. I'm under indictment. I am guilty. I'm a sinner. I need it to be paid for. Sin is paid for by death. And I owe a debt. I owe a debt to, to justice. I owe a debt because I have, I have violated justice. I have violated what's right. I violated God's uh, order in creating me. I, I am guilty. The wages of sin, the wages of sin or death is death. So something we need to understand about forgiveness. Uh, Forgiveness is not just some arbitrary thing God could have set up in heaven and go, okay, well, I, you know, I forgive the debt. You know, much like uh, our, our president of the United States has, has basically just said, you know, we're going to forgive the college debt. And a lot of people think, uh, college loans, uh, a lot of people think, well, okay, well, you can just do that. Why not? Well, to say I forgive it means somebody else has got to pay for it because every debt has to be paid for and so, you know, so the taxpayers are going to pay for it. And whether you think that's right or wrong is not the issue. The issue is you don't forgive without it costing something. If, uh, if you owe me $100, you owe me $100. And either you're going to pay it or I have to pay it. And uh, either one of us, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt you to pay the $100 because you're not going to have the $100 to use for something else. 
If I say, okay, I forgive it, then it's going to cost me $100 worth of pain. So forgiveness requires pain. It requires suffering. It just does. So this whole deal that we kind of have in our minds of, oh, don't think about it. No, don't worry about it. Nah, it's no problem. Yeah, you know, no issue. Uh, you're forgiven. I'm afraid a lot of times that's not real forgiveness because real forgiveness is suffering the pain of that debt. And uh, only when we have been forgiven that way can we forgive that way. That's why he is saying, if you are going to follow me, then you'll be able to forgive that way because that's how I forgive. So not only will you be able to be loved and love my way, you'll be able to forgive and forgive because you share my life. And the third thing that that, uh, that happens, the third thing is necessary, is Jesus must go to reveal the corruption that is that that's in human institutions. I mean, God has designed them for our, our good, but there's corruption in them. Uh, so he had to be rejected by the religious leaders, the people who were the head guys in, in, uh, in Judaism. And he had to be rejected by Rome, the head, head guys there. So he is revealing in his going to Jerusalem in the cross that there is no human institution that has not been corrupted to some degree by power and money. So I think it's interesting in, uh, interesting in our day when there are people who are, who are, are you know, saying, hey, all, all the systems are corrupt, you know. Uh, racism is systemic. Yeah, so is greed systemic. So is narcissism. There, there is no human institution that has not been negatively affected by sin, by power, the love of power, and money. And uh, so, yeah, so you, 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 you cannot depend on any human institution to be your protector, provider, uh, and promoter. <laughs> that's, that's Jesus' role. And, and so he came to expose that, and I need to be released from that dependence upon uh, human institutions. So, so, there, so Jesus said, I must go. It, it's part of the plan. And, and the, it's obvious that up until now, the disciples did not understand that. Even after his death, you remember the story of the Emmaus Road. Two of the guys were walking down the from Jerusalem to Emmaus, about seven miles, and they were down in the dumps big time because Jesus had died. And so he went to them and said, hey, did, did you, you never got it? You never understood that the scripture says I must die? There had to be a debt paid. You can't just overlook it. There had to be a change made. And so, yes, I must die. And if I must, and you're going to share my life, you must. Uh, so, so Peter, uh, like us, and by the way, if you think you would have done different than Peter, then you're living under deception because you, you and I would have done the same thing. Why? Because we think like fallen humans think. It's like, no, 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 Jesus. Uh, let's go in and be a powerful king and it's okay to have, you know, be loving and all that, but let's, let's destroy those other things. So uh, one of the great truths that I, I find in this text here is that Peter exhibits for us what happens in the, in the human, human soul. Peter is listening to two voices. He's got a voice, and you say, ah, yeah, no, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, listening to voices. I don't, I don't, I don't listen to voices. Yes, you do. There's a conversation going on inside of you all the time. Uh, you may not put words to it, but usually you do. They're, they're unspoken word, but they're there. They're two, they're two voices. The one of them is the voice of condemnation coming from the accuser, the Satan that he rebuked. There's another voice that's coming from God, if you're, if you're a believer. It's coming from God, and it's saying, I have done everything necessary to reconcile you to God. You have peace with me. You're clean. You're forgiven. You're my son. That voice is, is speaking to you as well. 
If you've been listening to the Satan voice for a long time, it has it, it's seated more in, in your in your psychic. But but you're hearing those voices. So so here's Peter, and Jesus said, "Who do you think I am?" And Peter says, "You're the Christ, it's not the living God." Jesus said, "Let me help you understand that. That was that was the voice of the Father speaking to you. You heard that voice, and you and you you bought into it, and that's right." You know, five minutes later, Peter is saying, no, we're not going to die. And he says, now you're listening to what sounds like the voice of human reason. It's actually demonic. And he rebuked it. And so I, I want to encourage you that you hear voices too. I, I, don't, I don't mean that you're some kind of weirdo. You're human. And you hear voices. And you hear a voice of condemnation that's based on fear. If you find that you are being motivated by fear, uh, you are being constricted by fear, then you're listening to the wrong voice because the voice of love has no fear in it. It casts out fear. So you either listen to the voice of fear or you listen to the voice of love. One of them's condemnation. One of them's affirmation. Uh, one of them is is, is God's spirit speaking to you? One of them is Satan's accusation. Now, here, here's where I think we mess up a lot of times. We just keep on putting up with Satan's accusations and because he it, it comes disguised as our thinking, as our voices. But what Jesus says to do is rebuke it. That is a wrong thought. I will not accept that. No. You don't have to say it out loud, but you need to say it. Wrong thought. No. I reject that. Rebuke it. And receive the voice of the Father. So, so, so that's something we can learn there. The next phrase I want to pick up is when Jesus said, if anybody's going to be a follower of mine, he, have, he must take up his cross and die himself. A follower of Jesus. There, there are lots of folks who think you can follow Jesus by, being, by knowing his teachings and following his teachings, his principles, and, and trying to imitate his, uh, his lifestyle. But Jesus said, no, following me is a whole lot more than just, you know, uh, having notebooks full of uh, information that I've given you and following my teachings. Uh, following me means you are sharing my life and my mission. And that is, uh, that's now that you know who he is and he's going to the cross, and his going to the cross is demonstrating that he has given everything. He held nothing back. Then for you to enjoy the life that he has, you also come to him and give everything. And as you give everything, you're throwing yourself into his hands so that uh, everything you have is going to a cross too. Every dream you have, every every hope you have, every agenda you have, you've given it to him, and it's gone through a cross. On, listen to me. Only that which has gone to the cross can be resurrected. Only that which we give away do we ever really possess. If you hang on to it, it never has, and it never has the mark of death, it will never have the mark of resurrection. And so you will, you will be operating on your own agenda. Therefore, your following Jesus will be a willpower thing. You will be operating on your will. You will be trying to uh, follow Jesus by bending your will or adapting his, uh, his agenda into yours. And you will be using Jesus as, as a Messiah. You'll be using him to, to build your own agenda. You know, you come to Jesus to make you happy. You come to Jesus to make you successful. You come to Jesus to make you prosperous. You come to Jesus to make you healthy. You come to Jesus to make your marriage work. You come to Jesus to help you build a big church. You come to Je okay. You see how easy it is to try to use Jesus as a utilitarian Messiah? And what he's saying is, no, no, no. Y'all got to understand, I'm going to the cross. If you follow me, you come to the cross. All of your stuff has to die. Give it to me. 
And if you give it to me, I'll give you back that which has gone through the cross of being purified and that which has resurrection power to it. And that's a whole lot better. It's a whole lot more. Remember on another occasion, Peter said, hey, it, if we give up everything to follow you, what do we get back out of it? Well, it was a human thinking again. Jesus said, well, uh, you get houses, you get more houses, more lands, more, more family, more, more of everything along with, with persecution. You get, you get to suffer with me. You, 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 you get to do it my way. So, so you, you wind up better, like resurrection is better than just healing or just or better than, than, than health. But, but you don't get to be a part of the kingdom unless you give up your agenda for his. Maybe this will illustrate it a little better. When I was a teenager going to youth camps and stuff like that, there was a big move in our stream, uh, Christian stream, of uh, talking about the lordship of Jesus. Lordship salvation was kind of the, the theme. And what, the, what was meant by that is this. A lot of people, they were saying, come to Christ at an altar call or whatever, and they come to Christ to receive Christ as Savior from going to hell. So you can receive Jesus as your Savior from hell, your Savior from the penalty of sin, but you don't really give your life to him. So you, you need a second experience whereby you, quote, make Jesus Lord. He is both Lord and Savior. So... The big deal was, okay, a lot of you, you know, made that decision, signed the card, got baptized, member of the church and all that because you wanted Jesus to save you from hell. But you really didn't intend to let him be your boss. So now it's time to let Jesus be your boss. So if he's your boss, he tells you what to do. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is, first of all, it's easier to make Jesus your boss than it is to let him be your savior. You say, really? Yes. Because to be your savior means that you are acknowledging that you need him, that, that you can't do anything without him, that he must save you not only from the penalty of sin, he must save you from the power of sin. He must save you from your selfishness. He must save you from your manipulation. He must save you from your deception. He's got to save you from every weakness you have so that you're totally dependent upon him. So I, I contend that it's easier to make Jesus Lord, that is boss, than it is to let him be savior. First of all, you let him be boss, it's like, okay, uh, I'll let Jesus be boss, but I'm going to ask him, what's your instruction? How do I, how do I love my, how do I do, how do I love, how do I handle my money? How, how do I get rich? How, how do I, how do I do this business? I, I, I want instructions. I want you to boss me, but I will still keep my agenda. I, I'm just letting you tell me how to do it. And uh, I, I still want to, to, to fulfill all my dreams, and, and, but I, I'll let you tell me how to do it instead of me telling me how to do it or somebody else. So, so having Jesus as boss, uh, that's better than you being boss, I suppose, but you're, you're, you're not receiving him for who he is. He's the Messiah. He came to die. If you come to him, you come to die. You come to say, I don't, I don't have an agenda. Uh, I, I'm here. I, I show up to you, Jesus. You're the one, the only one that can love me unconditionally. You're the only one that can forgive me so that it really does work. You're the only one that can free me from my attachment to the world and the systems of the world. You're the only one that can do that. And uh, so I give my life to you. I choose to give everything up for your agenda. So what, what, what do you want? And if you're letting Jesus meet all the needs of your life, then you're going to realize that the gospel is the most powerful thing in the world, and you are going to adopt his agenda. And his agenda is the gospel. Preaching it, practicing it, proclaiming it, living it, the implications of it. So, uh, 
so it's, it's not bad news when Jesus says to the disciples, okay, you know who I am now. Let me tell you how it's going to work. Let me tell you how, we're, how I'm going to set all things right and how all the other kingdoms are going to be destroyed and are, we're going to do it this way. Death, resurrection, ascension, and then you sharing my life out there. And by the way, he said, some of you standing here will get to see the beginnings of that. You're going to get to see it happen. You're going to see it really does work. So I, I want to encourage you today. Do you believe Jesus is Messiah? Do you believe he actually died on the cross and at his death on the cross, he forgave your sin? He cleansed you from your uh, unrighteousness? He, he cleansed you from your stain, your shame, your accusations? Do you believe he made you his son? Do you, do you believe you're a son of God? Do you believe he defeated the devil? Do you believe that his kingdom rules? What are the ramifications? What are the implications of that? If you believe your sins are forgiven, you don't walk around any uh, another day or another moment feeling guilty and feeling, you, feeling under indictment and feeling like you're disqualified. If you really believe he forgave you, you got your head up and you come boldly to the throne of grace with your needs and saying, I can't make it, Jesus, without you. I'm trusting you totally. And you know that your need is what qualifies you for grace. If you believe you're a son of God, you act like a son of God. You don't act like a slave. You don't act, act, act like you deserve to be in the back room. You enjoy the presence of God. You talk to him. You expect him to talk to you and you enjoy his presence. If you believe Satan is defeated, you don't let him accuse you and and knock you around and, and whatever. You rebuke those thoughts and you rebuke that deception and you choose to believe the truth. What, who Jesus is and what he's done have implications that become mandates for us. It's a mandate that you receive forgiveness and forgive. It's a mandate that you receive love and love others. It's a mandate that, that you live in freedom and give other people freedom. So his work becomes the mandate, not some law written on a paper or in some kind of document. So we have the privilege of following Jesus, following the Messiah, the one who came to make everything right. And as we follow him, we'll see things be being made right all the way up until the day he comes again and makes everything right and uh, and and his glory will be on the earth and cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Isn't that good news? Well, I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you so much that you have given us the privilege of being your followers, followers of Jesus. And that you made it possible for us to start over, not just have willpower and try to do better, but to have cross power and to be changed. We know that our Commitment never transforms anything. It was your death, your resurrection that transforms us. So we yield to that. And I, I thank you that your spirit goes out with these words, with, with your word, and it will, it will bring fruit in every heart that hears. I pray that you give people a, uh, that hear a, a, a token of your commitment in the cross and that they would know that they have heard and they would hear, hear your voice saying to them, oh, that's good. You didn't get that from yourself. You got that from the Father. And then they would be empowered to live that out. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for being with me this month. I enjoy being with you. Until next month at this time, this is Dudley Hall with Kermit. Kerygma Ventures. <laughs>